Sometime last year, I started dating this guy named Steve. He seemed perfect. He was handsome and caring, and he had a lot of money. I felt really comfortable with him. The only problem was that I wasn't being completely honest with him about my past. I met him right after I had moved to the city to escape my crazy ex-boyfriend Miguel. I went through hell in my last relationship and really had trouble talking about it with anyone. On my first date with Steve, obviously I didn't tell him anything about Miguel. But then we kept on seeing each other and I started to have real feelings for him. I didn't know how to bring up Miguel, like it was never the right time to talk about something so heavy. After about a month of dating, I was feeling pretty guilty about not being open with Steve. He deserved to know everything about me, even the difficult parts. So when we went out to a restaurant for dinner, I decided to pull off the band-aid and tell him. I didn't say every detail, but I told him the main points. That I had an ex who was off his meds and violent, that I basically fled my hometown, and that I still have anxiety issues because of it. Steve, being the amazing boyfriend that he was, listened to everything I said as if he was taking mental notes. He asked me a bunch of questions, really specific stuff like Miguel's last name and our old address. It felt a little weird at the time, but Steve worked in IT. He was always a very technical, meticulous person, so maybe he just wanted as many details as possible. The next morning, I was still asleep in bed while Steve was off in the kitchen fixing breakfast. I could hear him humming to himself, but that didn't really wake me up. I woke up because my phone started buzzing. I heard my sister's voice on the line. She asked me if I'd been on Facebook lately. I told her no, and she said that everyone was posting memorial photos of Miguel. He had died the night before. I know it sounds terrible, but I was thrilled to hear the news. I won't tell you what it was like living with Miguel, but he was an absolute monster. He deserved what he got. Then I started to feel pretty guilty for thinking that. I asked my sister what happened and she said that she didn't know. Nobody knew except his parents and they weren't talking to anybody. I decided not to think about it and just go about my day. Steve and I had breakfast together. Nothing eventful, just a normal couple's breakfast, though Steve seemed to be in an extra chipper mood. I wanted to tell him about the news I just heard, but I thought that would ruin our breakfast. I went to work after that and tried to be as productive as possible even though my mind kept drifting back to Miguel. I checked the news a bunch, but there were still no specifics about what had happened to him. That afternoon, Steve surprised me at my work with a bouquet of flowers. He'd never done that before. I asked him what the occasion was, and he said that he wanted to make sure I had a good day. He convinced me to leave work early, and we went to take a walk around the park together. The flowers were beautiful. He was in such a good mood. It was a very romantic afternoon, until we were all alone in the middle of the park and a really weird smile spread across his face. He looked like he was proud of himself. Then he asked me, So, how's Miguel? That's when I knew that Steve had something to do with Miguel's death. It wasn't just a coincidence that my ex died the same night that I told my current boyfriend about what a monster he was. Horrified, I backed away from Steve. What did you do? I asked. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I was just online and I happened to mention your ex to a couple people. One thing led to another and I might have signed you up for a little kill swap. What the hell is a kill swap? He looked around to make sure no one was nearby. Then he explained that he didn't just work in IT. He used the deep web to work with clients that were very particular about their anonymity. And somewhere in the deep web, on some website that no one can find, there's a place where you register a person you want killed. Then you partner off with another client, agreeing to kill each other's target. It's a perfect plan, he said. There's no way to get caught because you never find out who the other person is. Everything is completely anonymous. So. You've sent someone you've never met to kill Miguel? Yep, he said, but I think he's from Santa Cruz because that's where you're going to kill his target. I couldn't believe it. This guy was crazy. There was no way I was going to murder somebody. How could he possibly sign me up for something like this without talking to me first? I ran away. I couldn't be near him anymore. Wait, 
he shouted at me. Let's talk about this. You can't tell any... I didn't hear the last part of his sentence because I was too far gone. I ran all the way back to my car and hopped in. The bouquet Steve had given me was on the car seat. As I drove away, I threw the bouquet out the window. I didn't want to be near them. But when I looked down in my lap, I saw the car that had fallen out of the bouquet. A street address was written on one side, an address in Santa Cruz. I knew what I had to do. I drove straight to the police station and showed them the address. I explained everything that Steve had told me, even though I barely understood any of the deep web stuff he was talking about. But when I said the words kill swap, the officer flinched. He was looking at the card at the time, but he threw it back at me. I don't want to see this. Take it away. Too late, I told him. You saw it. Now whoever lives at that address is in danger. Can you help this person before he's killed like Miguel? The officer took a long, sad breath. Whoever lives here is already dead. I've dealt with kill swappers before. The people in those deep web groups always have backup killers waiting. But that's not the worst part. I was afraid to ask. If someone ever goes to the authorities with any information like you just did, then everyone they love will be killed. I really wish you hadn't shown me this paper. For your own safety, I'm not going to write a report. I grabbed the paper from him and went back to my house. All of Steve's stuff was already packed up and gone. As soon as he realized I'd gone to the cops, he fled. It's been a week since I talked to the officer, and so far, two of my cousins and one uncle have already been killed. I know that more deaths are coming. I don't know how those people knew I went to the police, but they did, and now I live in constant fear. All because my boyfriend wanted to use the deep web to help me overcome my past. All I wanted was a nose job, plain and simple as daylight. They bullied me back in elementary school for having nostrils that are too big for the rest of my face, and I honestly thought they were right. So ever since I started making my own money, I've been saving up for one. And sure enough, after four years of saving and living in one room studio apartments, I finally had enough for a nose job. Guess what? The clinic I had an appointment with closed down without notice. Apparently, they hadn't paid their taxes in five years, and whatever crook they were paying to get away with it was finally put behind bars. Just my luck. Of course, in this small town, that was the only available beauty clinic. The nearest recommended facility was in San Francisco. That's a good three-hour drive away. I didn't know if I would be able to afford a big city rate for the procedure, and my two-week paid leave already in motion. I was desperate for an express solution. So, of course, like anyone else in a pinch these days, I turned to internet forums for help. After wasting the first day of said paid leave, I was finally able to find someone with a concrete lead. Kathy Mandy 666 pointed me to a Dr. Daniel Leeds. I gave his number a call. He sounded like a friendly old man who was apparently practicing out of his home at a Highlands, the town's high-end gated community where all those city people who want a taste of the small town life without actually living the small town life lived. Sounded good enough to me. We discussed the payment terms quickly and he actually gave me a 50% discount, said he wanted to give back to the community. Amazing, a generous wealthy city doctor who gave discounts for small town folks' as charity work. I couldn't wait for Dr. Leeds to cut up my nose and be done with this whole thing. Walking away with extra spending money most definitely sounded nice too. As expected, Dr. Daniel Leeds lived in one of those really nice brick country homes you saw in the movies. It actually occurred to me then that for the 25 years that I've been alive, I never once set foot behind the gates of Highlands. And there I was, staring at a Highlands country home, knowing full well I have everything right to be here, and about to have my nose and hopefully my life changed forever. A nurse answered the door and immediately led me to the kitchen where I was served a very fancy looking buffet including a shrimp cocktail. Delightful, I guess. The nurse, Melanie, was a very polite, stern lady, who then led me to a sterile operation room where Dr. Leeds himself stood waiting. Already in his surgery robe, he looked exactly how I imagined he would. In his 60s, well-groomed, and with a friendly smile that could only come from a life lived comfortably. 
I had already told him everything I needed to about the type of nose I needed. So it was straight to changing, lying on the table and anesthetics. Nurse Melanie explained that once I woke up, I was allowed to stay at a room provided by Dr. Leeds at his home for a week to recover. The meds were already taking effect then, so I nodded along and fantasized about how nice that would be. New nose and a free vacation at a nice country home. Not bad at all. As promised, when I woke up, I had been transported to a lush, comfortable bed in one of the rooms of Dr. Leeds' country home. The sun filtered through the window. It was a beautiful day. I couldn't wait to see my new improved face. There you are. How are you feeling this afternoon? Asked Dr. Leeds, popping his head into the room. I let out a series of garbled nothings and realized I wasn't fully awake yet. The anesthetics must still be doing its work. Shh, that's all right. Take your time, he said, crossing the room and cradling my head. This is odd. Why does he feel like he can touch me this way? Oh no. Was he your run-of-the-meal pervert then? I let out more garbled noises and tried to pull myself away from him, but that was when I noticed the chains. My arms and legs were chained to the bed. Oh God, what does he want with me? Shh, it's all right. You're safe. Shh. I realized fighting was futile and that the best thing for me to do was to lay still and wait to see just what it is he is going to do with me. Helpless, a chained up toy. Nurse Melanie walked in then, pushing a cart of food. More exquisite, fancy looking food, just like the buffet. She moved aside and I saw that what was on the platter was, there was no mistaking it. On the platter was my old nose. For your initiation, said Dr. Leeds. See, I'm an aesthetician, meaning I pursue beauty. And you, Lois, through your willingness, hard work, and dedication, have also shown that you're also pursuing beauty. Hence, I have decided that you're a worthy resident at my house, where we dedicate ourselves to a lifelong pursuit of beauty. I couldn't understand what he meant. What does he mean, pursuit of beauty? He must have seen the panic in my eyes because he continued. We've beautified your nose, and should you choose, you may consume your old nose, consume your past unbeautified self, and pursue your ideal self, one that I will gladly help you achieve. I looked at my nose on a plate and back to Dr. Leeds. But if you choose not to, well, this will be the end of your journey, and we'll be using your body to help beautify other people, those who will be dedicated to the cause. That drove me over the edge. I just wanted a new nose. Now I have to deal with this mess. Well, I guess at the end of the day, a nose is nothing but flesh, tender meat. Once cooked, it should be good enough to eat. The metallic taste of blood filled my mouth as I masticated on the flesh of my old nose. Tears streamed down my cheek, mixing with the warm, salty liquid. Dr. Leeds watched me with a detached fascination, his eyes gleaming with a morbid curiosity. You're doing very well, Lois, he said, his voice dripping with condescension. You're becoming one of us. With each bite, I felt a part of myself slipping away replaced by a cold, hollow emptiness. The familiar contours of my face, once the source of my insecurity, now felt alien, a grotesque mask that I was forced to wear. You see, Lois, Dr. Leeds continued, his voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper, beauty is not just about appearances. It's about sacrifice, about shedding your old self and embracing your true potential. His words were like poison seeping into my mind, twisting my perception of reality. I was no longer Lois, the girl with the big nose. I was a work in progress, a sculpture being molded into perfection by Dr. Lee's scalp. Days turned into weeks, and I lost myself in the doctor's twisted world. I consumed my body piece by piece, each bite a sacrifice to the altar of beauty. My reflection in the mirror became a stranger, a grotesque caricature of my former self. One day, Dr. Leeds announced that I was ready for the final stage of my transformation. He led me to a room filled with surgical instruments, their gleaming metal surfaces reflecting the harsh fluorescent lights. This is where you will be reborn, Lois, he said, his voice filled with a twisted excitement, where you will finally achieve true beauty. I closed my eyes, surrendering myself to the inevitable. 
The pain was excruciating, a searing inferno that consumed my every thought. When it was finally over, I was no longer human. I was a creature of Dr. Lee's creation, a living testament to his twisted obsession. I opened my eyes and a gasp escaped my lips as I saw my reflection in the mirror. I was a chimera, a patchwork of human and animal parts, a grotesque mockery of beauty. Dr. Leeds stood behind me, his eyes wide with satisfaction. Magnificent, he breathed. You are truly a work of art. I turned to face him, my eyes burning with red. You monster, I hissed, my voice a distorted echo of my former self. He smiled, his teeth gleaming in the harsh light. I am the artist, Lois, and you are my masterpiece. My sister Lily took me to the Burning Man last year. I usually didn't join Lily on her wild adventures, but I had just gotten dumped by my boyfriend and I needed a distraction. On our first day there, as we were exploring the area and looking at all the weird art installations, a really handsome bearded guy named Clay introduced himself. He noticed Lily and I were checking out an art exhibit made out of old motorcycles. He asked us what we thought about it. Honestly, I thought it was really ugly, but I didn't say anything. I'm glad I didn't because Clay said that he created the piece himself. He seemed really proud of it too. For the rest of the festival, we ended up spending a lot of time with Clay. He and Lily seemed to really hit it off. I liked him well enough, but it was obvious that my sister was the one he really felt a connection with. He had this artistic spirit, just like Lily. He'd come to music festivals throughout the year and really dive into the experience, and then he'd go back to work as an IT guy. Lily worked in retail, but her lifestyle was pretty similar to his. At the end of the three days there, I was more than ready to go back home. I really needed a shower. Plus, I needed to sleep in a real bed. I told Lily that I was glad that I went, but I never wanted to go again. She understood, especially since I didn't meet a guy like she did. So we packed up all our stuff into our little rented RV and got ready to head out. Clay came over and invited us to come visit him sometime. Lily said yes, though I really hoped that she was just being polite. A guy like Clay is fun to be around at some random music festival, but he's not the kind of person I want to hang out with in the real world. I would have forgotten about him completely, but about a month later, Lily started getting these really nasty messages from a bunch of anonymous accounts. Someone had found her on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, pretty much all of social media, and they were saying the nastiest things. She kept reporting the harassing accounts, but as soon as she got those blocked, somebody else popped up. It sounded like it was all coming from the same person. Lily really started to freak out. She didn't want to get the police involved yet, but she knew the messages were becoming more threatening. So it was only a matter of time before things escalated. And that's when she decided to call Clay. At the festival, Clay had explained that part of his job was finding information that no one else could. That included tracking down stalkers and harassers. He had a pretty high success rate, at least according to what he told us. Lily and I were home at the time. She had gotten a particularly nasty message on our email and she finally called Clay. I knew that she hadn't talked to him since the festival, but I don't know if maybe they texted each other since then. After all, they did really hit it off. Lily kept everything on our speakerphone so that I could hear. She and Clay talked about the online harassment and the best way to stop it. She read aloud some of the messages she received and Clay sounded genuinely disgusted. He let her finish. Then he said that he'd finally identify the harasser within the week. He spent a lot of time building online contacts and staying active on the deep web where his messages couldn't be traced. Honestly, he made himself sound like a hacker or something. He didn't ask for payment or anything. Lily was just so grateful that she promised to come visit him as soon as this craziness was over. After the call, I was nervous that Clay wasn't going to come through. He seemed like the kind of guy who overpromised and underdelivered, but Lily seemed 100% confident in him. For the next two days, Lily didn't get a single harassing message. She thought that Clay had done his job, but I warned her not to get her hopes up. She called him for an update, but he didn't answer. I left Lily alone for a couple hours to run some errands, and when I came back, I saw Clay's truck parked in the front of our yard. He'd come to see Lily. 
I parked on the street since the driveway was blocked, and I started to head inside. When I got to the porch, I froze. Clay and Lily were talking in the living room, and I could hear their voices through the window. They were talking about me. I'm so sorry, he said, but it looks like your sister was the one who was posting about you. I can't believe it, Lily said. Why would she do that? Because she's jealous of you. She doesn't want us to be together. Clay was going to say something else, but then he turned and looked right at me. I'd been caught. I slowly walked inside, ready to defend myself against Clay's obvious lies. I was closer to Lily than anyone else. There was no way that she'd believe his story. When I stepped inside, both Clay and Lily looked at me like I was some terrible criminal. Lily even stepped behind Clay so that he could protect her against me. You don't believe him, do you? I asked her. Lily looked down at a piece of paper in her hands. I guess Clay had printed out some fake evidence against me. She thought for a long moment and then asked me, Why are you doing this? I'm not, I shouted. I stepped forward ready to grab the bogus evidence in her hands, but Clay stood in front of me, puffing up his chest. I think you should leave. This is my house too. Clay and I started loudly arguing with each other. Lily just watched the whole thing horrified. I looked at Lily, my eyes pleading her to believe me. I told her that he was lying. He was probably the one harassing her all this time. It was some big twisted plan to stay in her life. For a second I thought she believed me, but then she stepped forward and pushed me. Get out before I call the police. I was heartbroken. I couldn't believe my own sister would trust some computer stranger that she met at Burning Man over her own blood. I knew Clay was manipulating her, but if I stayed any longer, I'd just make the situation worse. I turned around and left. I knew that I could stay with my friends for a while, but I wanted to help Lily first. So I drove straight to the police station and explained the situation to the police. The man did a quick Google search of Clay. He didn't even need to use the deep web to find out that Clay had a criminal record for harassment and stalking. He printed out the file and I took a photo of it on my phone to show Lily. She never responded to my message. That afternoon I came back home. The whole place was empty. Clay and Lily were gone and most of her stuff was taken too. It's been months now. I'm still working with the police to track down Lily but I'm slowly losing hope. She made a horrible choice when she decided to trust him, and I'm terrified of what happened to her. My name is James, and I recently separated from my wife, Mandy. It came completely out of the blue. One day she sat me down and said that it wasn't working out between us. It's not you, it's me. I was shocked, and I tried to get more information out of her. There had to be a more specific reason, but we kept going in circles. She said that she hadn't been happy in a long time. I asked if this had anything to do with Derek, her handsome co-worker. They'd been spending a lot of time together, and I'd always had my suspicions that something was going on between them. I shouldn't have said anything, because she started shouting about how I was accusing her over nothing. The conversation didn't end well, obviously, and I packed my stuff and left. I figured I'd give her time to be alone and think about everything. I loved Mandy so much, and I didn't want to lose her. That night, I went to my brother Parker's house to crash. He told me I could stay with him as long as I needed, but after a week, he kicked me out. He said that I was depressing him, and that he needed to concentrate on his own marriage. I didn't have a lot of money saved up. And I didn't have anywhere else to go, so I ended up checking into the Rosemont Motel, which was the only motel in my budget where I could stay long term. It was on the shadier side of town, surrounded by old warehouses, and the building was filthy. The only good thing about it was a small swimming pool at the back. I started taking a swim every evening after work. It was the only time when I could relax and stop thinking about Mandy. On my third night there, I met a woman at the pool. She was young and beautiful. She introduced herself as Sarah and asked how long I was staying there. I told her that I didn't know. She seemed pretty friendly, so we got to chatting, 
and I explained that my wife had kicked me out, but I was still hoping that we'd get back together. Sarah seemed disappointed. I assumed she was interested in a quick hookup, but she didn't like the fact that I was still technically a married man. I asked her about herself. She said she was working for her brother, but she didn't get into any more specifics. She told me a little about her life, but she kept bringing the conversation back to me and my marriage. It must have really bothered her. Still, we seemed to hit it off, and she invited me to have a drink in her room. I refused at first, but she explained that nothing was going to happen between us. It was purely platonic. I agreed, and after I went upstairs to dry off and change, I knocked on her door, room 18. She greeted me wearing loose pajamas. She held a bottle of wine that was already open. I almost changed my mind and was about to leave, but she assured me that nothing was going to happen between us. We sat at her small table and started drinking. She encouraged me to keep drinking, almost like she wanted to get me drunk. I went through several glasses before I noticed that she was still on her first one. It seemed like she wasn't drinking at all, just pretending to. I started to get a really bad feeling, but I guess the alcohol was doing its trick. I didn't leave. We talked about normal stuff like movies and music, but every once in a while she'd ask me a question about Mandy. I don't know what got into me, probably the alcohol, but I mentioned my suspicions that Mandy had cheated on me with her coworker Derek. Her eyes widened. That seemed to really intrigue her, so she started asking me more about him. I started to really trash the guy. I didn't know him that well, and despite my suspicions, I didn't have anything against him. He always acted friendly to my face, but I was so overcome by anger over my separation that I really started laying into the guy. I said that he was an idiot who was terrible at his job. I said he was slimy and unattractive. I even mentioned his bad breath. Sarah just sat there and listened, face blank. Then she slowly stood up and walked toward her dresser. You shouldn't have said that, she said. I tried to ask her what she meant, but before I could, she spun around with a pocket knife in her hand. She held it towards my face. I jumped out of my chair and backed away, tripping drunkenly over the carpet. Derek is a good man, she said. He's so much better than a loser like you. Sarah was a lot smaller and thinner than me, but she was sober and driven by pure rage. She held me down with one hand and used the other to drive the pocket knife <clears throat> deep into my shoulder. I screamed for help, but at a motel like this, no one was going to come to my rescue. I had to fend her off myself. <clears throat> she used her palm to drive the knife deeper. I guess the pain gave me the encouragement I needed. I pushed her off of me. She slammed against the wall. Before she could get back up, I kicked her in the side. The dresser was a foot away from her, and the motel's bulky old TV was right on top. I grabbed it and pushed it closer to the edge. I demanded to know who she was and what she wanted. I made it clear that if she didn't answer, I'd push the TV on top of her. Her knife was still sticking out of my shoulder. I was too angry to feel the pain. It should have been easy, she said. Why didn't you just keep drinking and keep your opinions to yourself? Who are you? I demanded again. I'm Derek's sister, she screamed from the floor. I work for him. What did he pay you to do? I asked. Nothing, she shouted. I pushed the TV so it was almost halfway off the dresser. If it fell on her, she'd be crushed. Fine, she said. He wanted me to get you drunk and then take some embarrassing photos. That's it. But then you started running your mouth and I couldn't stop myself. But why? Blackmail, idiot, she said. So you'd agree to the divorce. Your wife won't be with them until you sign the papers. It's nothing personal. As soon as she said that, all my anger left me. I felt this overwhelming numbness. I wordlessly walked out of the room, went to my car and drove to the hospital to get the knife removed. On the way, I called the police. Both Sarah and Derek were taken into custody. I don't know exactly what crimes they committed or what the punishment is, and I also don't know if Mandy had any idea about their plan. What I do know is that I'll find out in the trial, and I never want to see my wife again. <laughs>